Hmm. Why don't we start? Just a second, one minute, please. Okay. So, thank you very much for uh, the possibility. Wait, wait for... a second. Okay, okay, let me know. Okay, now it's time to start our next session. My pleasure is to introduce you, Professor Thomas Shorkio, with the title, Order on Exchange, Observations and Properties. Please, 40 minutes. So thank you very much. I will try to uh, show the background and uh, the history of this uh, nearly 50 years old uh, search in high energy physics. Uh, and I will detail three observations of other on exchange, which are all um, kind of statistically significant or published in the literature. And uh, there is a big uh, ongoing uh, discussion. Also, I will highlight some of the details, but I will finish with a completely unexpected uh, result, uh, which came out from model dependent analysis of one of the properties of this Odaron exchange, which relates to Pomeranchuk theorem. So I am very glad to be able to present this for a predominantly Russian audience. So uh, I try to go to the next slide. So this is a 48 years old uh, scientific puzzle, uh, at least uh, when it was solved, and now it's 50 years old. Uh, Lukashuk and Nicolescu suggested uh, in 1973 that uh, there might be an odd component uh, of elastic scattering that changes sign for crossing, and uh, it corresponds to regized three gluon exchanges by Pomeron, the dominant term for driving the uh, total proton-proton and proton-antiproton cross-sections at high energies is uh, crossing even. And uh, Pomeron is uh, like a regized two-gluon exchange. And uh, the other on name was coined uh, 20 years ago by joints on leader Nicolescu and Lopez. And then uh, I also would like to mention a very interesting contribution uh, kind of uh, first uh, swallow, so to say, by Efremov and Peschansky, which was uh, uh, in uh, 1972. It was a Dubna preprint, but as far as I know, this uh, uh, idea, which is very, very ingenious and bright idea, it never made to a refereed paper. So the priority goes to Lukashuk and Nicolescu, as far as I can see. But uh, if some of uh, you knew what happened with this Ephraim of Peschansky Dubna preprint, please kindly let me know. So the other one is uh, known to be extremely elusive experimentally. So uh, no question about the possibility of other on exchange in theory, uh, but uh, the experimental observation turned out to be very, very difficult. For example, there was a fair attempt by Brixton et al. in 1985. And you see that uh, the data points look to be rather convincing. By the way, do you see my mouse on the screen? Yes, we see it. Thank you. So here, there is a characteristic difference in the deep 
refractive dip and bump structure of the differential cross section of elastic proton proton and elastic proton anti proton uh, collisions. Uh, but uh, when you evaluate the signal and take the ratio of the two, you seem to be uh, uh, finding a peak, but with very big error bars. And when you evaluate the statistical significance, it uh, is in my language, it's, it's an indication. Uh, so the terminology that I use in this talk is that if the statistical significance of uh, search for effect is less than three sigma, then statistically speaking, it's in agreement. And there is no signal for new effect. Indication would be if you see a signal between three and five sigma, evidence or observation, if the signal is greater than five sigma in significance. And discovery to me means that uh, you see a five sigma signal for the first time. And uh, so this Braxton at all paper qualifies as an indication using this terminology uh, because it's uh, greater than three, but less than five sigma. And in QCD, as I mentioned, uh, for example, there is a three gluon integral equation and uh, uh, kind of a, a Kwiatkowski Prashalovich published the evolution equation for other on exchange uh, in QCD. Uh, Yannick Wojciak uh, published the other on intercept uh, connecting to Regge phenomenology. In QCD, Bartas, Lipato, Vaka uh, presented results and Bartas, Contreras, and uh, Vaka uh, generalized the fixed running, uh, fixed coupling constant calculation to running coupling. And uh, there was recently, uh, two years ago, a CTEC webinar by Yuri Kovchakov, who very nicely summarized the theoretical developments in QCD. I cannot uh, go into detail, but uh, the main point is that uh, in theory, uh, three gluon exchange and uh, its properties are calculable from QCD. It's well established, no question. Uh, but uh, it's a possibility and the really interesting uh, uh, story is that this is a, a standard model of physics, but it uh, was not uh, really discovered uh, for 48 years. So what happens here? And I would like to show you this paper, which I uh, gave a talk at uh, Santa Fe, at uh, organized by Los Alamos uh, people uh, at the ISND 19, uh, 2019 uh, meeting. And uh, this uh, uh, is not very well known. Uh, it discusses other topics, but uh, the second half of this paper, which was actually uh, anonymously peer-reviewed and published in May 11, 2020. It uh, discusses a 6.26 sigma Odaron effect. And uh, the conference uh, archive is from 2019. So the Indigo page or the web page of the conference has this uh, result uh, added to the talk. At the time the talk, the method was clear, but uh, we just... Uh, supplemented after a few weeks the results. And the main point is that uh, uh, it is unfortunately uh, only a conference proceedings uh, in, from 2020, but archive has the timestamp of May 11. So I think this is the first conference uh, result, but uh, then there are journal publications uh, for Odaron with greater than five sigma. And uh, these journal publications are important. Uh, I think the first one, as far as I know, was published by our Hungarian-Swedish team uh, in February 2011. And uh, then uh, it went through a peer-reviewing process. You can see it was more than one year. It's one year and, and uh, nearly three months. It's uh, then the second work uh, was published in July 2021 in its final form. This was, uh, the first one was a model independent uh, investigation, but the domain of validity was determined uh, only from the second model. The second one is a model calculation 
uh, uh, based on a Polish uh, model of Bialas Zat. And uh, then the third paper, which is uh, the first one among the experimental collaborations, uh, this was published in August. And uh, then uh, you see that uh, these results received very large online attention, uh, as indicated by this uh, uh, kind of online uh, presence uh, marks uh, available from the journal web pages. Um, and uh, also the TOTAM D0 PRL received almost uh, uh, like two thirds of the same online attention. And uh, the the our second paper by two Hungarians was not really uh, catching a much online attention, but the first one was really really uh, considered to be uh, uh, like one of the few uh, top to, top two percent results on, for online presence. And then uh, the total collaboration continued the publications because in the PRL. They published only uh, the uh, ATV data without uh, describing how it was measured. And they also added one data point at 2.76 uh, to their earlier publication. Uh, this new data point is not described so far as far as I know. And uh, basically the main point is that uh, this completes the description of the experimental data with the exception of that single data point. And then we cross-checked uh, the ATV uh, new data uh, with the Polish model, and uh, it seems to be increasing the statistical significance. And uh, uh, then uh, the question is about, uh, can we do model independent? Uh, presentations and and uh, fully complete the model independent proof. This is the scientific subject of my talk, but uh, I would like to mention one particular aspect, which is a bit funny. So uh, it seems that uh, unfortunately we uh, two <laughs> poor Hungarians, one professor with a student, and also like uh, four Hungarians with a uh, with a, actually a Swedish colleague from originally getting PhD in Dubna, Roman Pasesnik. So we we managed to take over uh, LHC experiment, which was having of the order of 48 uh, uh, kilo Swiss 40, 480,000 uh, Swiss francs per year annual budget. So this was a problem. And uh, then uh, basically, it seems that uh, you can understand what is going on by using a parallel about the three oldest Hungarian universities. So if you check the web pages of University Page, Debrecen and, and uh, the Utrecht University, both claim that they are the oldest in Hungary. Uh, for example, Page uh, says that it was established in 1367, and then uh, they don't speak about the continuous operation. The University of Debrecen uh, says that it was established in 1538, and uh, Utrecht University says that it was established in 1636, but they all claim that they are the first under certain conditions. Uh, so what is important is that there is a statement and condition structure. And this is a philosophical remark by Dardashti at ISND 21. You can check the link uh, in my talk. So there is a generic structure that a scientific statement is valid under certain conditions. If you change the condition, the result changes. For example, uh, Page says that it's the oldest in Hungary. Then Debrecen says that it's oldest in Hungary under the condition that the operation was continuous emphasis is on the operation and not on teaching, and in the same city. Debrecen was under uh, Ottoman occupation for a certain period, so obviously they could not teach all the time. 
Earth Rush University says it's dropping the condition that it is in the same city because it was established in another city, northern part of Hungary, that was not under Ottoman occupation. So they stressed that they were teaching continuously. But the name of the university changed and the location changed. So depending on the condition, you can uh, change the result. For example, I am giving the talk from the Mata Institute of Technology. This is the oldest university in Gyöngyös, Hungary, because, uh, uh, because I mean, this there are no other universities in Gyöngyös, Hungary. So, so it, it's important, and this is going on here. So obviously there are some questions of prestige, uh, but I would like to focus on the science. So the Hungarian Swedish team published uh, the Odaron with 6.26 uh, uh, sigma at least, and you see what happens. We normalized out the low T part of the differential cross-section uh, and uh, plotted on the horizontal uh, axis uh, the slope uh, times uh, the four momentum transfer. So it's uh, the main point is that in these variables, you would have e to the minus x uh, for the diffractive cone. And uh, there are two conditions. We took all the D0 and TOTEM data published at 1.96, 2.76, and 7 TV. And uh, the other condition was that we could not, we could observe that the PP data show a scaling. Surprisingly, uh, I will detail a bit more, the scaling extends to very large values of, of uh, minus B times T. And uh, you see a clear scaling violation uh, if you compare it with the same scaling function for proton anti-proton. So uh, you expect that the scaling holds at 1.96 TV2, and then you see that the uh, clear difference between the elastic a differential cross section at the same energy uh, is uh, visible with a very large sigma. So this, but these are two conditions for the validity of this derivation. Now we had the model dependent result, and you see here that there is a model that describes up to uh, say um, diffractive minimum maximum region, and not in the very low T region both the D0 data and the uh, PP data at, uh, so this is what uh, the left side is proton anti-proton at 1.96 TV, the right side is 2.76 TV totem data from LHC. And uh, the extrapolation of proton anti-proton differs from the proton-proton results. And if you go to high energy, the difference is so huge that I mean, it's no question several points are outside of five sigma. Uh, so, so the total significance uh, is actually uh, greater than seven sigma uh, under the condition that you take 1.96, 2.76 and seven TV data. And the domain of validity is now more limited. It's limited uh, to the diffractive minimum maximum region from 0.76 to 1.2 GB square in T. And uh, we tested that also uh, SP by T as data from 0.546 TV are included into this description. So the S range is bigger, the T range is smaller. And uh, there is a, a model dependent result uh, already from the very small energy range of 1.96 to 2.76. But we also observed here that uh, the extrapolation of PP curve down to 1.96 is not sufficient. Uh, you need at least two energies to get a significant signal. And uh, with a new T with AT with totem data, we confirm this result. This is published uh, later in 2022 uh, in EPJC. And now the uh, third uh, discovery paper is from D0 Totem. I was a member of this collaboration at the time when uh, the paper was published. The paper is, as far as I know, is totally correct, but it relies under certain assumptions. 
So I would like to highlight the first assumption or zeros, which is uh, really not very well uh, spelled out in the paper. Uh, but this word that the result is almost model independent is included. And this is very important because, you know, almost model independent means that it's not completely model independent. So it relies on eight different models. Uh, and the new element of this, that it takes other on signal from uh, zero for momentum transfer at the optical point at 13 TV, which is not included in our earlier investigations. And uh, um, basically it assumes that the signal from the differential cross sections is uh, not modified if you take new models into account. And it claims that from this extrapolation of uh, totem uh, of PP bar proton proton to, one, to the D0 energy of 1.96, at least 3.4 sigma is obtained. And uh, at t equals 0, 13 TV from rho and sigma tot, they claim a 4.2 sigma. And when they combine the two, you get greater than 5.2 sigma. Uh, however, Donna Chilancho published a paper in Physics Letters B in 2022 saying that there is no other on sigma at t equals 0. And uh, Professor Petrov with Kachenko published another paper in PhysRD saying that uh, uh, if you reanalyze the uh, part of the signal at t equals zero, the rho, uh, the error bar of totem is, seems to be underestimated. And if you evaluate it with uh, the method of Professor Petrov, then you find that actually the signal decreases uh, from 4.2 sigma to 1 sigma. So obviously then uh, this destroys the totem combination greater than 5.2 sigma. Uh, so these are published papers, but not the only one. Uh, now uh, there is an even uh, worse uh, uh, situation. You can see these papers of physics letters with Donacci, Lanchov, and Petrov, and Kachenko, and Fizzeldi. But uh, the Österberg, the physics coordinator of TOTAM, responded to this criticism in LHC forward physics meeting, but it's just a conference contribution. Obviously, a detailed TOTAM D0 paper is in preparation, but it's not yet publicly available as far as I know. So the key point is that uh, the error bar of rho seems to be underestimated by TOTAM, but uh, at least it is debatable because uh, you can uh, describe the same data uh, with the rho equals 0.14 as pointed out by Donacilla, uh, Lancho, and Petro. So there is another problem now. This is even, even a bigger problem. Uh, uh, criticizing this physics physical review letters, uh, short paper by D0 and Totem. Uh, so one of the conditions uh, is criticized by the Atlas, and uh, it's published in Europhysics uh, Journal C this year. Uh, uh, basically, they don't agree with TOTAM about the value of the total cross-section, and the total cross-section and rho was used in a combination to get the other signal. So if one part doesn't agree, then the total signal at t equals zero goes away. And uh, so explicitly this uh, paper says something like this, that this zero and total either discovered the other one or not. <laughs> so they are not sure. Uh, they confirm the value of rho, but only under the condition that certain models that are considered to be extreme, they are excluded uh, from the error bar determination. So basically they say that there are models that give a description of uh, the low uh, T data uh, for uh, the row determination, uh, which have different values of row, but uh, they excluded those models from the error bar determination. But there was a 
Chinese, Greek, Italian, German collaboration also in physics letters B this year. Uh, and they said that, oh, well, we reanalyze the extrapolation of totem and taking it, uh, taking the t equals zero signal uh, on face value, but doing a model independent extrapolation technique from other fields of physics, they find that the uh, signal goes down to 4.8 uh, sigma under certain conditions. So they say, oh, it's a good paper, but unfortunately it's a bit too small, uh, an effect uh, to be considered to be a, a fully bulletproof discovery. So again, uh, the main point is that uh, the uh, totem D0 response was given uh, by Kenneth Steberg in Hungary in August 2023 at ISMD, but it's just a conference contribution, so a published uh, response is uh, necessary. So the status of D0 totem is that at least four published papers question the validity of the derivation, but they don't question the validity of the result in some sense. So the formalism, I, I would like to go a bit uh, through. Uh, uh, it's elastic scattering, and uh, I, I suppose you know all of these details that there is an optical point called A, and uh, there is a slope, which is the logarithmic derivative of the differential cross-section, and uh, the rho, which is the ratio of the real to the imaginary part. Both B and rho are, in principle, S and T dependent, but we can take the t goes to zero limit and then usually just we denote the s dependence or sometimes put a subscript zero. And uh, the total cross section is related to the behavior of the imaginary part by rho uh, related to the ratio of uh, real to the imaginary part. And uh, I have to uh, skip some certain technical details, but in the diffractive cone approximation and also due to the optical theorem, the optical point and uh, the total cross sections are related uh, with rho. So if you change rho, you change the optical point even if the total cross section is a constant. And uh, of course, we are me measuring the modulus square of the elastic scattering amplitude, which uh, can be described in B space using this iconal picture. And uh, what is important is that it's always elastic scattering is a genuine quantum process because the scattered wave interferes with the plane wave that propagates without uh, scattering. And uh, so elastic scattering cannot have a classical uh, description, but the inelastic uh, can have a probability interpretation because uh, this probability distribution in energy uh, and the uh, impact parameter variables uh, satisfies the uh, usual positive definiteness, it's between zero and one. And uh, so this uh, can be interpreted in a probabilistic term. And the main strategy that I would like to highlight, and uh, probably I have to skip the details, is this, we are studying proton-proton uh, and proton-antiproton -proton collisions. And so we can always uh, have these amplitudes, their physics amplitudes. And then if you take the uh, sum uh, or the average and the difference of these two amplitudes, uh, the average corresponds to uh, uh, some crossing uh, even exchange and the difference uh, changes sign for crossing. So it's... Uh, an odd component. And uh, if you go to very high energies, you know that uh, any massive uh, exchange, exchange of massive quanta goes uh, very strongly down. It was investigated by Sonia Jankowski, Broniowski. They find that for energies greater than one TV, this is uh, much smaller than the currently achievable error bars. So it has uh, simple consequences. If there is no other on exchange, then the differential cross sections, if there is no other on means that crossing or the exchange at sufficiently large energies above one TV. Other on is glue on exchange. So that means that you can have massless quanta exchange. So there is no 
necessary sub suppression of, of uh, order on exchange with increasing energies. So if the crossing load part of the amplitude vanishes, then it's uh, low that the differential cross sections have to be equal. And uh, on, on the other hand, it's not true that if the uh, differential cross sections of proton, 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 anti proton are equal, then there is no direct exchange. The reason is that there could, could be a phase. Uh, the modulus square of the amplitudes must be equal, but the amplitudes themselves may be different. On the other hand, it's true, and this is what we will utilize, that if the differential cross sections, the modulus uh, squares of two complex functions are different, then the two complex functions cannot be equal, so there must be another amplitude. And uh, so this uh, possibility was uh, first mentioned as far as I know, uh, so that other uh, exchange uh, can be successfully studied at LHC Energies uh, with Laszlo Jankowski, who introduced us to this uh, topic and except, of course, uh, Volodya Grimov, who was in Budapest for a long time. Uh, but uh, so basically, Laszlo Jankowski was the one who started to introduce us to this topic, and I'm very grateful for his uh, contributions and this paper with him. So our strategy is to look for, scale out the trivial as dependencies. So we, we, in our model independent data-to-data -data comparison, we scaled out all the t equals zero observables and uh, look for data collapsing behavior and uh, look for scaling violations as a signal of order. The important thing is that in the TeV energy range, you can say that you discover the crossing load component or that's the same as order on because it can be only glue on exchange. So uh, basically uh, there is a small, uh, region where uh, usually the uh, diffractive cone region where the differential cross section is exponential. And uh, we started from the, so to say the oven. So start from a place that you know, you know this corner close to T equals zero. And uh, then you know that if you scale this out, the you, you scale uh, with the B times sigma elastic, then uh, the result will be an exponential in the variable uh, minus t times b. So we introduce this h of x uh, scaling function. h is also for Hungary, uh, so it's for us it was easy to remember. But actually, the reason was that we tried to introduce f and g before it was less successful than h. So uh, the advantage is that we know the form it's e to the minus x in the diffractive cone, which is expected to work for x much less than one region. So we started from a place that we know, measured both pp and p bar p, and this is the ISR result. The re expected region was that close to one, we have a data collapsing behavior. And totally unexpectedly, even up to x uh, nearly 30, we see an approximate data collapsing behavior. So the scaling worked much better and in a much bigger region than, than we expected. Although in the diffractive uh, minimum region, this is not a good scaling at ISR. But uh, both in the first and in the second cone region, it works beautifully. And then we did a small derivation. Uh, main point was that we, we observed that if uh, something depends only on the impact parameter divided by an S-dependent scale, and uh, the row is uh, constant. In those classes of models, if you uh, evaluate uh, uh, H of X, it turns out to be uh, directly connected with the modulus square of the Fourier transform of the scattering in the impact parameter. Uh, space when you scale out the S dependent scale. So if only one scale depends on S, you have a natural uh, H of X scaling in the whole region, not only in the different uh, So also the other advantage is that we don't 
have any uncertainty coming from the total cross section or optical point because we know that at zero, this scaling function is one. And uh, that means that the normalization error cancels. This is a comparison of the uh, results at 7 and uh, 2.76. You see a perfect agreement. At 13 TV, something else happens. So uh, H of X uh, scaling is violated at LHC top energies. And uh, we are thinking about the reasons, but we do not use the 13 TV data due to this uh, region. Anyway, we want to go down to D0 energy is not up. And if you do an extrapolation, you usually start from points that are close. And uh, then these are the technical parts that I have to skip because I want to uh, focus on the more important physics uh, oh. consequences. But the main point is that uh, the data density was not the same. So we had to apply some ribbing. For example, there was one point at two point uh, at 1.96 TV from D0, and it fall between two points of totem. So we extra interpolated the totem points in between values. So it's like a ribbing that you can do. Uh, and similarly, when we projected the low density data to the high density, we did a similar interpolation. This is the key point, and uh, then uh, uh, these are details. One point I mentioned that we also search for possible up and down shifting within the systematic errors and choose the shift value, which minimize the difference. So it, in a sense, it's minimalizing the order on signal. And even with that minimization, we have uh, like uh, this uh, 6.26 signal at least. So I cannot uh, go to greater details, but uh, I know that uh, in uh, particular in the Russian school, people like uh, uh, the kind of uh, evidence that hits the eye without any statistical uh, analysis. So when you took the ratio of the scaling functions uh, of the proton antiproton at 1.96 divided by the proton scaling function at 7 TB, you see a clear peak and the suppression. So if there is no daron signal, this line would be one. And it's clear to the eye that there is a peak and the suppression. So it's not, uh, not it cannot be one. So you don't need to use many statistical arguments. Uh, and also the same for this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, model, uh, independent and model dependent analysis, but I want to show a bit this part, which is the asymmetry parameter. Uh, this uh, is, you take the difference of the two scaling functions for proton, proton, and proton, anti-proton, and divide it by the sum, and do the same for proton, proton, and two energies. And if the asymmetry parameter does not vanish for PP and P bar P comparison, then you have a crossing what term. And in PP, we expect that it vanishes because there is a scaling. You see that within systematic errors, indeed for PP, the asymmetry vanishes, while for the uh, PP and P bar P, the asymmetry is so clear that you don't need to evaluate the statistical significance. It's clear that it's not consistent with one. It hits the eye without any, any statistical analysis. And uh, we did several uh, investigations of uh, ranges and uh, maximizing the signal and so on. Uh, and uh, we tried to complete the proof. The, basically, the main point is this, that if uh, we compare the scaling functions of proton, proton, and proton, anti-proton outside diffractive minimum maximum region where the signal is maximal. Outside of this, we find an agreement and less than a three sigma deviation. And this means that indeed, where there is no other on effect, uh, P, P, and P bar P are the same. So the scaling uh, can be continued down to 1.96 model independently, but I, I this is the signal region 
uh, and we are safely above the five sigma threshold. Uh, if we optimize at seven PV, the sigma increases uh, in the best range uh, to more than seven sigma. We could do predictions, but I skip it because uh, the star data at 510 GV are still not yet out, but we did a prediction. And so the summary is that we have at least uh, 6.26 sigma Oderon effect. Uh, and uh, you don't need to do a sophisticated statistical analysis because the asymmetry parameter or the ratio shows this effect so clearly. Now I would like to ask how much time do I have? You almost over. Time is over. Almost over. Yeah, so I just uh, yeah, very quickly to... show the last part, uh, which uh, is that we try to extend the model dependent studies to small t to address this question of donor J. Lanchoff, is there a signal or not? And if any of the optical point slope rho sigma l sigma to differs, then if it is statistically significant, then we have a signal. And the first paper is published uh, in MDPI Universe in this year, uh, which uh, realizes that you can have also a Levy exponent. This is a stretched exponential fit. Uh, alpha Levy is uh, two for uh, straight exponential fits, but it turns out to be that uh, this Levy generalization of the model results in surprising uh, uh, analytic formulas. And uh, the main point is uh, just uh, now formulas I cannot uh, give in make great detail, but the optical point and uh, the slope uh, depends on, and the total cross section and elastic cross section depends on the geometry of the proton in this model. So that means that you have a quark uh, distribution for the quark distance dichord distribution and a Levy part exponent. And all of them are uh, determining A, B, uh, sigma tot and sigma L, but the rho does not come in. Uh, and uh, due to this uh, result, which is analytic, uh, and uh, due to the analysis of the data where we find that indeed, there is a good description now at very small t with this expression. Uh, so basically, uh, I just come to the key point without uh, going to the details. Main point is that this alpha exponent is uh, uh, significantly different from two, but the value is uh, nearly two, but the error on it is very small. So it's it's uh, giving a much better description than the usual one. And uh, this alpha is important. And the main point is that rho, however, is totally different in PP and P bar P. Now, uh, the key point of the results is that due to this, the slope uh, and the total cross-section in proton-proton and proton-antiproton seems to be equal within this model for proton and antiproton at, as the energy increases from PV up. And this actually comes to Pomeranchuk because Pomeranchuk said uh, in the soft form of the Pomeranchuk theorem that the ratio of these two cross sections goes to uh, one at large energies. And uh, the difference uh, in the strong form of the Pomeranchuk theorem goes also to zero. And in this model, the strong form of the Pomeranchuk theorem is valid. Uh, and this means that uh, the optical point, however, carries another or signal because it depends also on rho, not only on sigma tot. So due to this, uh, we predict that there will be a small other or signal, but uh, probably less than the error bars in PP, P bar P optical point comparisons, rho will be different. And due to this reason, the elastic uh, cross sections also. So I would like to offer this talk to the memory of Isaac Jakovlevich Pomeranchu and Volodya uh, Glibov, who was uh, introducing me in Budapest to the beautiful physics of elastic scattering. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot for nice presentation.
please, a very urgent questions or remarks. We have only one minute left. But uh, we will have time for questions during discussion session. So please come back for discussion session, Tamas. I will try to come back and uh, your questions are very welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you again. Hi, hi guys. Hello. Let's... I have a question. A question? Yes, I have a question from Zoom. Okay. My name is Mikhail Sergenko. But very, very short and urgent. Yes, of course. I would like to ask this speaker what he knows about behavior of rigid trajectories in the scattering region. I mean, there's much more behavior of rigid trajectory in the scattering region, I mean, perturbative region. Are they linear or not? Okay, uh, I don't know the answer to this question, but what we did is, maybe I will show in the discussions, we try to analyze the exponent of the order on trajectory, and it seems that uh, the uh, our first analysis was not yet, uh, statistically speaking, uh, uh, in the range where the model was uh, cross-checked and uh, shown that it is valid. But nevertheless, the so-called preliminary or first results, which are not necessarily final, indicate that the exponent is much larger so the total okay. cross section okay. coming from the other one is about okay. one millibar less Let's than the okay. errors. Okay. But but the main point is okay. that okay. Okay. Uh, it's a threshold effect. Okay. Thank you. So much speaking. Okay. No, uh, you ask. You may ask. No, wait, 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 Mikhail, about... Mikhail, wait, 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 postpone discussion to discuss in session. Uh, okay. Mikhail. Okay. Thank you. It will be just uh, three hours or two hours later. So okay. Thank you. wait a little bit. And let me call uh, the next speaker, Tamar.